Welcome, my human friends. I am Funky M, mutant and proud. My power? Multi-spectral, multi-dimensional vision. I see everything. And I saw that too. Hmm. Anyway, I will be your host as we take a very special look at the cinematic journey of the mutant race in the famous X-Men movies. Now, it's best to begin at the beginning, because starting anywhere else would just be confusing. So let's go all the way back to 2000. Oh, 2000. Can't believe what I was wearing at the time. And I was so thin. <laughs> but anyway, yes, back to 2000 for the first of our Mutant-thon. X-Men. Released in 2000 and based on the wildly popular comic book, X-Men is our first glimpse at the world of mutants and the decades-long struggle for peace. A young girl is unknowingly drawn into a secret underground war, along with a mysterious yet dangerous bare-knuckle fighter. So come with me, my human friends, as we discover the world of... The X-Men! Meet Marie Duncato a seemingly ordinary girl, whose life is about to take a turn for the strange. <laughs> now I was going to make a terribly sexist ex-girlfriend's joke here, but I am so much better than that. She had planned to see Canada, but arrives there sooner than she'd hoped. And this is where we meet the arguable star of these movies, Wolverine. Drawn together by fate, our pair head off to new adventures, which arrive in the form of Sabretooth, who is soon seen off by another set of mutants. So yeah, the mutants in the leather costumes are two of the X-Men, Storm and Cyclops. Bet you can't guess which is which! Our hero awakes in upstate New York, and makes to escape which is hampered somewhat by Professor Charles Xavier, who explains a little about mutancy, and reveals Marie's fate. You know, I used to be an X-Man. Gave it up, though. It's a dangerous life. Especially when you don't really have any kind of offensive or defensive powers. And that would be that. But for the little matter of Robert Kelly, a US senator who seems rather concerned about mutant registration, Ugh, anti-mutants. They are the worst. Do you know they still try and make out the baseline and flat scanner slurs? Slurs! After half the things they call us! Most of which is unrepeatable, so I won't even bother. Just really cheeses my onions. But Senator Kelly's flight is... diverted and a meeting with mutant master of magnetism Magneto does little to allay his fears. And worse, for Kelly at least, he is mutated by Magneto's mysterious machine. All of which makes his escape that much easier. Yeah, reminds me actually. Back when I was on the X-Men team, we had a student at the mansion who could do stuff like that. Figured he'd make the cut. Never did while I was around though. Back in Westchester, we learn not to wake a sleeping Wolverine. And Marie is left to deal with the consequences. Rogue, she's gone. Professor Xavier puts a team together to recover her. But Wolverine figures he can do that himself. And then Magneto turns up to collect Marie, now known as Rogue. No, I tell a lie. She's been going under the rogue alias since at least Canada. But it's only become important now. But his old friend Charles Xavier works by proxy, and tries to talk Magneto out of it. Which goes about as well as you'd expect. Okay, so this is what I love about this movie. You got these two classically trained actors, and they're poring over this philosophical dilemma. 
And you would pay good money to see a play like this. A real honest-to-goodness play. With live actors and everything. Enter the mutated Senator Kelly with the rest of the plot. Which unfortunately means that he's outlived his usefulness. And when Professor X is indisposed... Now this one needs some explaining. You see, it was Mystique that managed to plant some green goop into Cerebro. You know, conning her way in there by making her eyes look like the professors or something. And then just putting this stuff in so that he wouldn't be able to find Magneto's hideout. Jean Grey uses Cerebro to find Magneto's hideout. And so the stage is set for our finale. The X-Men arrive at the Statue of Liberty and fight their way up to the top. And if you are interested in watching mutant on mutant action, you sick sick people, there's a ton of camera phone footage on YouTube. Actually some of my best moments are on there, you should go check them out. Where Magneto is waiting. Now Magneto's marvellous machine mutates your average bad, abnormal human into a mutant, just like me. Well, not just like me, but, you know, with their own thing. Unfortunately, the mutation is unstable, and the subject has a highly increased risk of dying. So not great. Also, using the machine takes a lot out of our Master of Magnet, so he's set up Rogue there to be his proxy. Great plan. But Wolverine's having none of it, and makes his move. Which forces Magneto to make his move. The X-Men deliver Wolverine to the machine, which again, goes about as well as you'd expect. Until Cyclops intervenes. And so the machine is destroyed. Wolverine gives Rogue his power, and all is well. But Mystique is still out there. And even a plastic prison can't hold Magneto forever. Well, that's the first one down. So how was it? Well, I think this one deserves its spot on the Mutant Thon team. This is the movie that made the superhero team movie cool. The movie that proved that the format could work, that the effects were mature enough, that the costumes, slightly samey as they are, could look cool, that the world was ready. And even after so long, I think it still works. The basic plot, as I seem to find a lot these days, is rather thin. Girl runs away from home, shacks up with Drifter, both are drafted into a lunatic's plot and team up to stop it, alongside a secret force of protectors. But it is so well acted, and the two Shakespearean thesps that bring to life our main protagonist and antagonist, Sir Ian McKellen and Patrick Stewart respectively, bring real gravitas to these roles. Because, at its heart, this is the conversation. The open debate, not as to literal superpowered beings, but more to those who dwell on the edges of gender, sexuality, society. Even in the age when these tales were first told in comic book form, one could paint Professor X as Martin Luther King and Magneto as Malcolm X. And these debates, by all rights, when they happen, should grind the film to a halt. But they're captivating! due in no small part to the casting of these two Shakespearean actors. And of course, we have to mention Hugh Jackman's Wolverine. Stilted and monosyllabic by necessity, this is still the character we knew and loved brought to life. Anna Pekin's rogue, by contrast, is a little too much googly eyes for my liking. And the rest of the main cast, being that this is the first of a supposed series, do seem a little half-formed, with respect to later incarnations. The flow, as it seems, focuses very much on Rogue and Wolverine, again by necessity. And again, the Magneto Xavier scenes seem less like padding and more like another thread of this tale. Overall then, director Brian Singer has taken a massive comic book juggernaut, streamlined it to its main characters, and told a simple story that resonates with everyone. And he's done a bang up job at that. Pity the formula gets a little stale from reuse from here on in. But hey, we'll get to that.
For now though, this is your marvellous mutant host Funky M inviting you to join me next week for the first sequel, X-Men 2. Until then, see you around, humans!